Hello and welcome back to our video lecture. Today what we're going to be covering is our chapter 6 which is inventory and cost of goods sold COGS. First we're going to learn how to account for inventory and there are three types of companies. One is a service company, two is a merchandising company, and lastly is a manufacturing entity. And a service company has zero inventory accounts. Merchandising has one inventory account, which is called merchandise inventory. And manufacturing has three inventory accounts, raw materials, whip, work in process, and finished goods. Manufacturing companies and manufacturing accounting is actually discussed in that class. So we'll focus on what statements the cost of goods sold are. So let me go back to that. So you'll see here the income statement has cost of goods sold. Notice there is no cost of goods sold for a service entity because salary expense is basically what the service entity has. So salary's expense here is the largest expense for a service company. Then cost of goods sold or COGS is actually in our merchandising. And keep in mind that this is in our income statement. So now the inventory accounts are on the balance sheet and we see that here and for the service company we see there is no inventory, right? Because you can't really inventory people. But for the merchandising company we do see inventory on the balance sheet. So how we account for items is basically on the balance sheet as we discussed this is cost, right? Historical cost and you're going to learn lower of cost or market is how we value inventory. So if the cost is $3 and the market is four, then we actually value it at three. We have the conservatism principle here. So that's how we put it on the balance sheet. Then on the income statement, we sell it for $5. So remember, price times quantity equals your revenues. And it also equals your cost, right? Cost or price, cost price times quantity equals your cost of goods sold as well. So here we have $5 as our sales. So if we take sales revenue, minus our cost of goods sold, we get gross profit. So make sure you have that formula in your Excel. Sales revenue minus COGS equals gross profit. So basically we want to note that inventory on hand, so on hand is in the balance sheet, and then what we sell, the cost of goods sold is on the income statement. So re realize that sales price is used to calculate sales revenue and cost of goods sold, the word cost is in it, so that's how we go ahead and calculate cost. So the number of units in inventory, basically we, look, we know how many there are because we physically count them, and then consigned goods, those are not included in inventory. So this is goods on consignment does not include an inventory. So basically what that means is that if you are a company and you go ahead and move your inventory to someone else's location for them to try to sell it, it is still um, your inventory. So it does not include anything held by another company. It's your inventory, but they're consigned goods. You only record it when it is sold. And then we did talk about our shipping terms previously. So remember FOB shipping point. So this is when the seller ships it, so like Amazon, when they ship it, that's when they record the revenue, so that's when they're also recording the reduction of inventory. Now at FOB destination, it's when the customer takes delivery, so when that customer gets delivery, they will record um, the revenue and the reduction of inventory. There are two types of inventory systems, perpetual and periodic. And the perpetual inventory system is probably the most common and it's the most used because it gives us real time data. And it is perpetual, meaning it's keeping a running record. So every time you go into Walmart and they scan something on their POS, their point of sale, which is usually their register, that item is recorded as revenue and as a reduction to inventory. You do have to count inventory at least once a year to make sure that your accounting record is accurate. And this is also required by an audit. An audit states that you have to, an auditor has to do a physical inventory observation. And it doesn't matter if you're using periodic or perpetual, it has to be done. The ease is that periodic, that's the way you know how much inventory you have. So it inventory must be counted at least once a year for a periodic system. What we do there is you don't keep a running total, so the only way you know what's on hand is by knowing that by counting it basically. So the perpetual system, we talked about Walmart. So this is every time that UPC gets scanned, you record the sale, which you're gonna do a debit to cash or accounts receivable. 
and you're going to credit sales revenue and you're going to do this for the quantity times the sales price. Now, when you update your inventory records, you're gonna debit cost of goods sold and you're gonna credit inventory. And this is gonna be quantity times the cost. So there's two entries that are needed. So now we see several entries that are recorded here. And so here when you're purchasing inventory, we know we're gonna increase inventory, so that's a debit. And we're gonna credit accounts payable because remember, accounts payable worked for our vendors and that an accounts receivable is for our customers. So here we have accounts receivable and sales revenue that we sold inventory on account. If that were cash, we would replace accounts receivable with cash. And then we have to re record the reduction of inventory or the cost of goods sold as a debit because that is on the income statement as an expense. And then inventory, which is on the balance sheet, gets reduced. So in this situation, if you were asked for the gross profit, all you would have to do is take sales revenue minus your gross profit and you would get 460,000 as your gross profit. So don't forget to have that formula in your Excel. So now what we're looking at is the T accounts for the transactions that we just did. So we see purchases are here. So this is a good T account to have in your Excel, right? So you would have beginning balance, plus purchases, less your cost of goods sold gives you your ending balance. So then you know from cost of goods sold here, that goes into the cost of goods sold account as a debit on your income statement. So these are very good so you could see additions to inventory are usually purchases, reductions are taken through cost of goods sold. So now what we're seeing is our cost of goods sold that's on our income statement and our inventory balance here. And if we go back, we see that our inventory balance was 120 and 540 was our cost of goods sold directly from our T accounts, which is now reflected in our partial income statement and balance sheet. So when we are looking to how we came up with that 560,000, there are items that you can include in the purchase price of inventory. Freight in is one of them. So freight in is basically what you pay to bring the goods to your location. You are allowed to include that price in your inventory. Then similar, remember we had gross sales minus discounts, sales discounts, minus sales returns and allowances to get to net sales. Well, with purchases, we have a very similar formula. We have purchases and we have plus the freight in, but then we also reduce purchase return, purchase discounts, excuse me, purchase discounts to keep it similar. And then we also reduce purchase returns and purchase allowance. You can also put them together if you like. In industry, we normally keep everything separate because that way if you have a separate general ledger account, GL account, then you're able to track how much money is in, the, in that account for the year. Because remember, these are all now contra accounts, right? And these are all contra accounts to purchases. So basically, if we do it separately, we'll see them and we'll track it. They're temporary on the income statement to get to our net purchases. So this is another formula that you should put in Excel, right? So you'll have the price plus freight in, and let's do it in a T account format. Maybe that will also help you. So for purchases, we have the beginning balance, and then we have plus freight in, and then we reduce it by returns and allowances and by discounts to get to our ending balance. So let's start recording journal entries. So if we wanted to record a purchase return of merchandise that cost us five $500, we're going to reduce accounts payable. Remember, accounts payable T account, that's a liability, so it has a credit balance, so we reduce it by a debit balance, and then we are going to reduce inventory. Note, this would be purchase returns if in industry. We're moving it, we're putting it in inventory just to show the one inventory account here that we did with the beginning balance plus the purchases, right? So this, it would be part of this number less our cost of goods sold equals our ending balance. 
this inventory would be part of the net purchase amount. And the reason we hit inventory is most of these transactions do not happen at the same time. Right, so if we go back to the previous slide here, we see when we purchase it, these two transactions may be at the same time because you get it, but then as you're reviewing the goods, you may um, have goods that were damaged in transit and you wanna return it, or maybe you're gonna call and say, hey, these were damaged, I'll keep them if you give me a discount, and an allowance, excuse me, and then when you go to pay the invoice, that's when you'll take the discount. So these don't always happen at the same time as cleanly as we see in the previous slide. Therefore, we're just going to credit inventory to show that that's a reduction of this purchase balance here. So now if we wanted to record a purchase of $1,000 in merchandise, now we're adding to inventory. So inventory is an asset, we're debiting it, and then we're crediting accounts payable to show that we owe this money. And remember, accounts payable are for vendors. And inventory, we very well know, is an asset on the balance sheet. And so is accounts payable, it's on the balance sheet. So now if we want to record the payment um, that we are actually taking the 10 day discount, remember this is a 2% discount if we pay within 10 days, otherwise the net or the full amount is due within 30 days. So to actually record this for the $1,000 payment, then we're going to make sure that you remove the $1,000 from accounts payable. Then we're going to take our 2%, which is $20, and we're also going to put that to inventory because by putting it to inventory, we're again reducing that purchase item and then we're actually just going to pay $980 because we actually took advantage of the discount we paid within the 10 days. So let's um, apply and compare these inventory methods. So basically, uh, which method is selected would mostly affect our profits, which is net income, which we know equals revenues minus expenses. It also, because the more net income we have, the more taxes we're gonna pay. So since our profits are affected, our tax liability is also affected. And the last item that's affected is our inventory. So we wanna make sure we understand that. Now, what we know already is that we know that we can include the price, we can include freight in as part of our purchases. So this is all part of your purchase amount, right? Then you can also have any taxes that you paid to get the inventory to sell. And then also here we know already that we have returns, allowances, and discounts. So make sure that you're aware of what you can and cannot include in the amount for purchases. Now, there are four different inventory methods. And basically, you can use any method you want. And as we mentioned, our net income, our cash, and our inventory is also affected by the method in which we use. So like FIFO, first in, first out is the most common in the US. And LIFO, last in, first out, is only allowed for US GAAP. Internationally, we have IFRS international financial reporting standards and that does not allow for LIFO. Then we have average cost which we can also be known as weighted average cost and lastly we have specific unit. So the specific unit is probably the easiest. You usually use this inventory evaluation method when the items are customized or when the items have, um, they're like huge. So for example, if you are doing chandeliers for hotels that are these grand big ballrooms, you can use specific unit inventory valuation because you know that that chandelier is right there located. There's only maybe two or three chandeliers in the entire um, warehouse because it's such a big, item and then you can say yes we specifically sold this chandelier to the ritz carlton therefore we know what the cost of that is the other methods there's really not that specific identification so and i would say that's used also for customized goods you know so if you're customizing a car it's very easy to tell who's getting what and it's specific unit or specific identification method now, the average method is weighted average, and basically that weighted average is all you're doing is you're taking your total cost and you're dividing it by your, so the total cost of each layer of inventory and you're dividing it by the quantity or the units to get the average cost. And then that average cost is used for both cost of goods sold and for the inventory valuation. So you're using the same amount. 
So let's work through an example. So here we have our data and, and basically what it's telling us is we had 10 units and that's our beginning balance that we purchased at $10 and the beginning inventory was $100, so that's easy, 10 times 10. And then during the period, we bought 50 lamps in two different installments we see here, right? So we bought 25 units at $14 and 25 units at $18. And basically then we sold 40 units. So we wanna know what price we sold the units at and what price we need to value our ending inventory. So how we come up with that is basically, we see our goods available for sale, gas, goods available for sale. So that gives us these items right here, right? So we have 60 units that are available at these respective prices because we're taking the extension. So, and this amount will be the same for all methods because this is what you buy it for. It doesn't change. The only items that change are our ending balance in inventory and our cost of goods sold balance. Okay, so then we're trying to find what the 40 units are valued at and what the 20 units are valued at. So in order to do that, what we have to do is what cost method are we using? So let's tr start with the average cost method. We have the same information. So basically we have the $900 that we came up with, right? And the 60 units. So these three add up to the $900 and here we add up to the 60 units. So that gives us a price of $15. So then it's pretty easy, right? We know we sold 40 units at $15. So then we have 600 units, and then we know we have 20 left at $15. So notice we still have the same uh, price, and which just basically at this point, we have our $600 in cost of goods sold and our ending balance, and we are using the same amount for both. So the average cost method is quite easy as long as you keep everything together. I did provide you an Excel workbook that has a tab for each one of these different methods where you can use the layers of inventory. I would highly recommend you are familiar with that. The format here in these PowerPoints are T-account format. And what I did for you in Excel is give you this template that just has it laid out. So hopefully that, and you, um, hopefully when you use that, it would make your uh, time more efficient when you're doing your homework. So now let's move on to first in, first out. And in this case, it's exactly that. The oldest items are sold first. This normally happens in a grocery store situation or anything like maybe in pharmaceuticals where we have um, items like a shelf life of two years. So you wanna sell the older pills first so they don't expire, okay? And then, but oh, the key here, I'm sorry to note, is that um, costs are assigned to cost of goods sold using the first layer of inventory and the ending inventory is based on the latest cost. And this is assuming prices are increasing. So you see in our example, we bought units for $14 and $18. So since the units are increasing, this would mostly stay in ending inventory and the $14 would be used possibly for our cost of goods sold. So we are using the same numbers um, as we did before, but now we're actually valuing them differently, right? So now when we sold these 40 units, right? So we take the first layer. So here we have the 10 units at $100. So that's the first layer that comes out. Then the next layer that comes out is these 25 units here, right? So, so far we have 35 units. So we need to take five units from this piece here, from this third layer. So now when we get these three pieces, we know that now when we add this up, we have 540. So you take the 100 plus the 350 plus the 90, and now you have the 20 units valued at this last inventory layer. So the same numbers give us, we're still ending up with the same 900, right? See 10, 25, and 25 is still our 60 units that are available, goods available for sale at the $900, right? So this is all our purchases and that is still the $900. But now our ending inventory is valued at $18 and we have three different layers of inventory here that value the 40 units that we sold. So that is using the FIFO cost method. Again, go to your Excel spreadsheet, put in these numbers, make sure you understand the formulas that we went over and that way that will help you kind of solving your homework problem. So our last inventory valuation method is FIFO, uh, LIFO, excuse me. So here, this is completely the opposite. The last costs into inventory are the ones that go into cost of goods sold or the first one out. And then the oldest costs are in inventory. So when we're looking at layers one, two, and three, and if this has $10, $14, and $18, LIFO now is taking these as our, this is our first inventory layer that goes into cost of goods sold. 
So let's see how this works out with our example. So we're still sold 40 units, and in this case, we're starting right here. So this is our last layer, which we're moving into cost of goods sold. Then we're taking, we only sold 40 items, so we have 25 here. So we need only 15 of these items that we need at the $14. So in this case, when we add these two numbers, we get the 660, and then we have to take the 10 units at the $14, and then we have to remember that these units here are for the beginning. So in this case, our cost of goods sold is 660 and our ending balance in inventory is 240. So we are going to pause here, so we'll pick it up on this illustration in our next video.